Amen. It's good to see you tonight. We're glad that you're here. If you're glad to be at church tonight, say amen. 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 If you're glad to be in an air-conditioned building, say amen. amen. Yeah, I think that was a little bit louder than wanting to be at church. <laughs> amen. Thank you for being at church tonight. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Let's stand and join in singing. When we all get to heaven, come ahead, brother. Amen. If you have your hymn books, it's song number 78, 78, when we all get to heaven. Let's sing it out on that first verse. Song 70, The Unclouded Day. The Unclouded Day on that first verse. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day.
tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of a land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded day. announcements. Uh, again, um, we have the youth fundraiser out there, the, the envelope fundraiser, pardon me, the envelope fundraiser out in the uh, foyer. If you would like to participate and be, be a part of helping the juniors and the teens get to junior camp and teen camp, uh, which junior camp will be the last week of June and teen camp will be the first week of July, and that'll be coming up. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Um, just grab one of those envelopes and return it either in that box or to myself or Miss Bethany. Uh, we'd love to have you pitch in for that. And again, the work day for those teens and juniors to earn that money towards those camps is this Thursday and this Saturday. So if they can't make one, um, hopefully they can make it to the other. But this Thursday and Saturday, I'll be here at 9 in the morning um, till after lunch. And so any time in there, if, if they would like to come and work, we've got some buses to clean and some grass to mow and some uh, lights to change and different things going on just to be a blessing to the church and also to be able to help them with the funds for that camp. Um, also on June 26th, that'll be coming up, um, we'll have a, um, we'll a sign-up sheet, I believe, um, pretty soon for that bake sale. On June 26th, we'll have a bake sale, bake auction. If you would like to make something um, to help out the teens to be able to come or just bring your money, June 26th, and buy something, that'd be a blessing. Um, I, love, I love desserts, and so I'm excited to see what's all on there. I'm going to be bringing some money myself if my wife will let me spend a whole bunch, but we'll see. Um, but thank you if you could be a help um, in any of those areas. We would love that. And just pray for the teens as well. Pray for the teens, pray for the juniors as we get ready for camps. Pray for the Bible clubs this week. We've got several teams going out. The blitzes have been kind of shut down due to COVID, but they are back together. We've got some clubs going on this week, and uh, we've got three clubs. One of the, again, some of the young folks got sick. Not with COVID, not with COVID, but uh, they're just kind of under the weather with whatever's going around. So uh, pray for the Bible clubs, and uh, pray for uh, the uh, young folks as they go out, that the uh, Lord will lead them to the good places, uh, to see folks saved and minister to folks, and then also pray for them as they, go out in the heat. Next Sunday's Father's Day. Of course, we have a gift for all of our men. Brother Mark Holmes will be preaching Sunday morning. And uh, I want to encourage you to get your young folks signed up for camp. Young folks ought to go to camp. Every, every time you get a chance to go to camp, you need to go to camp. I loved it when I could go to junior camp and senior camp. You know, there for a year or two, I was able to do that. And that was such a blessing. Don't forget the summer revival coming up in July, July 16th on that Saturday soul winter training with Brother Treadway, and then he'll be preaching. And then in, the, in August, we've got our mission conference. I'm so looking forward to mission conference. We'll say more about that in the future. We didn't get to have our uh, prayer meeting time this morning, I mean this evening, so I want to share with you uh, a couple of prayer requests. Uh, 
Miss Verna Ray is going to get to go home tomorrow. Or she's going to get out of the hospital. I, I may have misspoken there. She's going to get out of the hospital tomorrow. It's been over 70 days. And so we certainly need to pray for Miss Verna, Brother Mike, and the folks there at uh, Hopewell Baptist in Napa. Uh, pray for them. Pray for the children. Pray that Miss Verna would be able to get her strength back very quickly and be back in her place serving there at the church. So thank you for praying for her. Continue to pray. Uh, Miss Suzanne Lovell has a test on Tuesday. Uh, they got some uh, a little bit of a, a kink in the test results on Thursday, so they're having another test on Tuesday at 9.15. They'll know the results on Thursday, and this is regarding bone marrow, and so that could be very serious. We want to continue to pray for Miss Suzanne. Please pray for her this week, and then also for uh, Brother Clayton Robinson's family. Brother Clayton's brother passed away. And uh, the service is going to be on Wednesday at 11 o'clock up at uh, Charlotte Funeral Home in Zachary. The uh, visitation is going to be on Tuesday from 4 to 8. If you'd like to uh, share your condolences to the family and your well wishes to them, uh, that's going to be on Tuesday from 4 to 8 and 11 o'clock at Charlay for uh, Brother Clayton Robinson's twin brother. So pray for that family this week. Brother, would you come, Brother Robert? Open your Bibles. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4 for our scripture reading tonight. And then this announcement on June the 25th, Saturday, June the 25th, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we're going to have a 90th birthday celebration for Miss Durbin in the gym. That's going to be a great time. I mean, the Durbins, the Durbins were here when Noah was here. And uh, so we want, certainly want to pray for, uh, we, want to, we want to celebrate with Miss Durbin at the, uh, at the birthday party birthday celebration 90th birthday celebration on june the 25th saturday from two to four in the gym and they certainly would like for the church family to be there to celebrate along with the family ephesians chapter number four brother robert ephesians four we're going to start in verse 17 to the end of the chapter this i say therefore in testifying the lord that ye Henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Lord bless your word. Go ahead and stand with me this evening one more time. Let's grab those hymn books and turn to page 91. And what a day that will be. Amen. 91, what a day that will be. We'll sing that this evening on that first verse. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is Shall see, and I look upon his face, the 
DJ to lead us in prayer after he prays. We're going to hear from the, the fundamental men. And I tell you what, I, I, I enjoyed, y'all should have been up here doing the congregational singing. We would have had the praise team. I enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed singing with them right there. So I might just hang, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Uh, looking forward to the message tonight. I told Brother Bachman now that uh, this is the first time we have the monitor in the back. And Brother Brian's already told me that whenever I run long, he's going to say, cut it off, preacher, cut it off. And anyway. <laughs> But uh, I can't see that far. I can't see it. So that's just the way it works. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thanks for being here tonight. Brother DJ is going to pray for us. You can be seated. We'll hear from the fundamental men and then Brother Bachman. Lord, thank you so much for the day you've given us for this evening. Thank you for the freedoms we have, Lord, to be able to come and be in service and just have a great time worshiping you, God. I pray that you'd help us to uplift your name and song. I pray that you'd help us as we get ready for the message. I pray that you'd help us to have our hearts prepared. I pray that we'd hear something, Lord, that you'd speak to each and every one of us, that you'd have our, have our hearts uh, prepared to hear from your word, God. We thank you so much for this evening. I pray that you'd just be with us tonight. Just send, send your spirit down, Lord. Help us to feel your presence. We love you, Lord, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. sat silent for too long while the darkness ever strong cast a shadow on this land but we're the children of the light we have hope that's burning bright we weren't made to cower we were made to stand let the church No, we will not. 
not compromise. Let the church, let the church arise. These are days for the church to be. Who Christ has made the church to be. Let the church arise. Well, we do thank you for the opportunity to be back with you here at Central Baptist Church, and we count it an honor. I bring you greetings from Patrick Cummings. If you don't know who that is, consider yourself fortunate. If you do know who that is, just just grin and bear it and pretend like you care that he said hello. Uh, But he is still at our church. Uh, We've tried to get rid of him, and it's not working yet. And so his picture's up in the post office. We're hoping the police will find him soon and take him away. But uh, you pray for Patrick, if you would. He's very involved at our church. We do thank the Lord for him. He's still just as crazy as ever, but we still thank the Lord for him. And we're thankful that no one else is quite like Patrick Cummings. But uh, I do want to greet you on his behalf. Take your Bible, go to 2 Kings in chapter 4, if you would. We're going to pick up there in just a moment. I do want to thank you for coming out for the service tonight. And for those of you that came to the early uh, singing time that we had at 515, if you weren't here, we passed out $100 bills to everybody that came. Sorry if you didn't make it, but uh, if you'll stop by our table back there, we'll at least let you buy a CD instead. And so we'd appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Brother Bartlett for having us in and for uh, allowing us to to be here for the service tonight. 2 Kings chapter 4 is a familiar passage of scripture. I'll just give you a little bit of background on it and we'll read a few verses and we'll jump into the thought tonight. As we know, the prophet would travel around Elisha from place to place and almost kind of a, a circuit riding preacher as it were. He would go from town to town, and he would visit back through often to other places, and uh, then he'd come back around, and such was the case here. He came through on a regular basis, apparently, this little place called Shunem, and a a couple there uh, took it upon themselves to entertain or to to host or be hospitable any time Elisha was in town. And uh, they'd take him into their home, and she'd cook a nice home-cooked meal from, for him. I'm sure that was better than whatever he was eating out in the wilderness. And she would try to uh, uh, make up a little place that he could stay, and sometimes Gehazi, his servant, would be with him. And I don't know if they had a pull-out couch or what they put him on or uh, if they slept on the floor or out in the back. I don't know, but they, they took care of him for a while. But it became such a frequent thing, and they certainly enjoyed having Elisha there so often that at one point... Uh, this was Shunammite woman went to her husband. And she said, hey, let's do this. Let's, let's have a little building addition put on the house here. We'll just uh, a, a little room for Elisha. And every time he comes through, we'll take care of him. And that way he'll have his own room. He won't have to sleep on the couch. And, 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 and he'll just have his own little place there. We'll put a little table in there for him and a, a little candlestick and, and a bed for him. And I, the Bible doesn't say anything about Gehazi. Apparently Gehazi kept sleeping on the couch. But at least Elisha had a place to go. And so sure enough, uh, the husband and she talked about it. And he said, you know, I think that's a good idea. And so they did that. And uh, he went down to Home Depot, and he uh, got some lumber and got it delivered, and he did a little building a room addition there on the, on the side of the building. And the next time Elisha came through, oh, they were so excited to show him. And uh, he walked in, and he had his bag, and she said, set your bags down here. We want to show you something. we got something special for you. And he said, okay. And so she said, now close your eyes. And she closed her eye, he closed his eyes, and they took him down the hallway. And when they got to the hallway, they said, okay, on three, open your eyes. How do you know all this? you, you got to be a Bible scholar to find out all these great details here. It's in the Hebrew. But, uh, and he said, so, you know, on the count of three, I want you to open your eyes. And so one, two, three, and he opened his eyes, and there was a door. And above that door, it said, Elisha's suite. 
And he opened the door, and sure enough, there was, I don't think it was very big, but it was room enough for him to have a bed and a little table and a, a night place. And she said, this is your room. It's not an Airbnb. We don't rent it out to other people. It's just for you. And every time you come through this way, you stay here. And we want to take care of you. And boy, he was so grateful. He was so appreciative. And uh, he, the next morning at breakfast, he just was overwhelmed. And he says, you know what? I, I want to do something special for you. Man, you took such good care of me. I love, boy, that's probably the best night of sleep I've had in a long time. Sure beats sleeping out under the stars and other places that I've been and sleeping on floors. And I sure enjoyed it. Boy, that was great. And I want to do something for you. What can I do for you? And she says, oh, now, Elisha, you don't have to worry about it. We did it because we love you, and we just appreciate you, and we just want to be kind. She said, no, 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 think of something I can do. I want to show my appreciation back to you. And he says, uh, I'll tell you what, um, maybe I could talk to the king and get your husband a job down at the palace. And she said, no, I've heard about government jobs. I don't think that's a good idea. I don't want my husband working for the government. I don't want that. And he says, well, how about if we move you in closer to town, I could probably get you a nice property. They're putting a Walmart in down there, and we could get you down close to the Walmart, and you'll just enjoy that. She said, no, no, I, I don't want anything like that. I, I like our little place here in the country. Plus, we just put this a room addition on for you. We'll just stay here. And he tried two or three things, and she turned him down on all of it. They went to bed that night, and the next morning, Gehazi came to Elisha, and he says, hey, I got it. He says, you got what? Well, I, I know what it is that you could do for this Shunammite woman. He says, well, what? Tell me. I asked her last night. She had no ideas. He said, I know this. I know that she really wants a child. She's been barren for all these years, and I believe it would be a wonderful thing if you would ask God to give her a child. So sure enough, at breakfast table, Elisha brought up the subject. And he says, hey, uh, Gehazi came to me last night. We were discussing it, and I think I know what it is I can do for you. And she says, well, what is it? And he says, I'm going to pray that God gives you a child. And she says, oh my goodness, are you serious? He says, yes. And she said, Elisha, I wouldn't ask that of you, but I will tell you, that's the deepest desire I've got. Of anything you could do for me, that's probably the greatest thing you could do for me. And Elisha says this, next time I come through, you're going to be and you're going to have that child you've been wishing for for so long. And the Bible says that in the course of time, sure enough, next time she came through, she was pregnant for the very first time. This barren woman, God answered his prayer and gave her a child. The child grows. I don't know how much he grows or how old he is when the story picks up where we're going to begin reading tonight. We know that he's been around for a few years. And the Bible says in verse number 18 of chapter 4 of 2 Kings, And when the child was grown, it fell in the day that he went out to his fathers to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to the lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, he brought him to his mother, and he sat her on his knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Now you've got to understand, after what we just learned about the history, now that miracle child, that one that she had prayed for and yearned for and longed for for so long that God finally gave her, he's now dead. Now, I don't know, as, the, as we said, the Bible doesn't say how old he was, but the Bible says she, she sat him on her knees, so I doubt he was 40. And, and he's, he's a child still, and, and so he dies, and you can imagine the heartbreak that she's feeling. The Bible says she takes that little boy and she lays him on Elisha's bed, that little room that they built for Elisha. She lays him on that bed. And then it says in verse number 22, And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men, and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, look at verse 23, It shall be well. Then she sat on an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel, and it came to pass that when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. That's how we know that Elisha was from the south, because he says yonder. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, look at verse 26, Is it well with thee? Is it well with, the, with thy husband? Is it well with the child? 
And she answered, it is well. I'm definitely not going to contradict the word of God. Because that's what the Bible says she said. And I believe that's what she said. But the truth of the matter is, it was not well with her. She just lost her son. It was not well with her husband. He just lost his son. It definitely was not well with the child. He's dead, laying on Elisha's bed. And yet when Gehazi comes to her and asks her those specific questions, is it well with you? Is it well with the child? Is it well with your husband? She answered, it is well. Now, I don't think she was delirious. I don't think that she was lying. I think this was a statement of faith. Because even on a day in her life that it had never been less well than it was that day, she by faith said, it is well. I want to take just a few minutes tonight and I want to give you some things to think about and ways that you can say it is well even when it's not. Because the truth of the matter is, in your life and in my life, yea, probably several times in your life, you will have a day, it is not well. You will be in a valley of your life. You will be through a hardship. You will be carrying a burden so big that it is weighing down on you more than you ever imagined you'd be able to handle. And yet, you too, if I believe you take these principles we're going to discuss together tonight, could say, even on a day when it was not well, it is well because of these truths. Heavenly Father, teach us from your word, and God, maybe somebody tonight is in that valley. Maybe somebody tonight is going through this this difficult circumstance in their life. Maybe not exactly like the Shunammite Shunammite woman, but they're going through something that's a hardship and a, a burden on their heart, and it is not well for them tonight. I pray that you'll encourage them, help them to use these principles to turn and increase their faith. But God, for some that uh, maybe are not in that position, that is coming. And God, for all of us, I believe, should you uh, not return soon, we'll probably go through another valley, another hardship. And God, we're going to need these truths in our life. So I pray that you help us to be able to, by faith, pocket them, hold them for that day that, God, we do need to be able to say it is well, even when it's not. In Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bible now and go to Job chapter 23. I want to give you a couple truths, and I hope that you certainly, if not at least write them down on paper, or write them down in your mind, because I do believe there's a day coming you're going to need these things. I believe there are days that I have lived and times that I've gone through that I certainly needed to be able to remind myself of the truths of God's Word that help me to, by faith, be able to see that things are well even when they're not. Job chapter 23 and verse number 8, you know the story of Job. I doubt probably anybody in all of history has had a worse day than Job had. Now we've gone through difficulties, but you've got to understand most of what happens to Job in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 all happened within about a 24-hour period. He loses all of his cattle and all of his oxen and all of his sheep and all of his servants All ten of his children die in the same terrific accident. His wife says, curse God and die. He's covered with boils from head to toe. I mean, in a short span of time, maybe the course of a couple days, all of these things come upon him. But the loss of all his physical assets, the Bible says, when one servant was walking out the door after reporting a terrible thing, the next servant began speaking right after him. Talk about back-to-back tragedies. Back-to-back difficulties, back-to-back hardship. That's what Job has gone through. And it says in verse number 8 of Job 23, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where doth he work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. Have you ever gone through a trial so deep in your life you were wondering if God even knew what was going on? It sure seemed like, at least, that you were forsaken. It sure seemed like you couldn't see what God was doing. And it boggled your mind to think, here I am a Christian. Here I am trying to serve the Lord and please, Lord, look at the hardship I'm going through. God, where are you? That's exactly where Job finds himself. But in verse number 10, he says this, But he knoweth 
the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I want to write down a few things this evening that will help you to say it is well even when it's not. First of all, this evening, we can say it is well even in the valley because, number one, God is aware. Job, how can you keep your head up when you've lost all your sheep? Well, God is aware that I lost all my sheep. Job, how can you keep going when you've lost all your oxen? Well, God knows that I lost them. Uh, Job, how can you keep from being upset when you've lost all your camels? Well, God knows that I lost them. Job, how can you keep from being mad when you've lost your donkeys? God is aware that I lost them. Job, how can you keep from being depressed when you've lost all your servants? God is aware that I lost them. Job, how can you keep from being in despair when you've lost all your children? God is aware that I lost them. Job, how can you keep from giving up when you've lost all your friends? God is aware that I lost them. He knoweth the way that I take. And can I tell you, dear friend, tonight, the same is true for you. And the same is true for me. There's never a day that you will go through that God is not aware about what's going on in your life. I'm not alone, Job says. I am not beyond God's knowledge. I am not beyond God's omniscience. I am not beyond God's watchful eye. God knoweth the way that I take. It is no news flash to God that I'm going through the valley I'm going through. God is aware. There's never been a battle God did not know. There's never been a burden God did not pre-weigh. There's never been a trial God did not approve. There's never been a sickness God would not have knowledge of. There's never been a struggle God did not supervise. There's never been a problem God did not allow. I can promise you, dear neighbor, whatever valley that you're in, whatever burden that you carry, whatever obstacle you're trying to climb, whatever sickness that you have, whatever heartache that you hold, whatever difficulty that you face, there is a God in heaven. And that God in heaven sees and he hears and he knows and he's touched with the feeling of your infirmity. You are not alone in your valley. God is aware about what's going on in your life. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should us shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. If his eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. If his eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. <coughs> the first thing that will cause your heart to say it is well, even when it's not well is God knoweth the way that you take, and God is aware. The Bible says the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Bible says he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. The Bible says how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. The Bible says he revealeth the deep and secret things, he knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. The Bible says, be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. For our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and God knoweth all things. Little Shunammite woman, your son just died. How can you say, it is well? Because God is the one that gave me the boy, and God knows he just passed away. He knoweth the way I take. He knoweth my frame. He knows how my heart is aching. He is aware of my circumstances. And I can promise the devil will come and the flesh will come and whisper in your ear when you go through difficulties and when you go through valleys and you go through hardship, you are all by yourself. Nobody knows what's going, what you're going through. Nobody feels what you're feeling through. Hey, that's a lie from Satan. God is aware and God knows and God knows how you feel. You'll never walk one step of your valley by yourself. God is aware. But it goes beyond that. Go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, not only how do I say it as well, even when it's not, because God is aware, but number two, Psalm 139, beginning at verse number seven. And the Bible says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. 
Secondly, God is just not knowledgeable from a distance. God is with me. I can say it is well even when it's not because secondly, God is around. You see, it's one thing for him to know what you're going through. It's another for him to go through it with you. It's a wonderful thing to know God knows, but it's even better to know that God says, and I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm going to go through this with you. God is around. Hey, if, he can, if I can never be outside of the presence of God, like I just read in Psalm 139, because God is everywhere, everywhere includes in my valley. Everywhere includes in my hardship. Everywhere, everywhere includes in my problem. Everywhere includes in my sickness. Everywhere includes in my difficulty. Everywhere includes in my desperate situation. Everywhere includes in my circumstance and my heartache. I never walk alone. I never hurt alone. I never lift alone. I never go alone. I never struggle alone. He promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's well, even when it's not, because God not only, does not, not, not only does God know, but God is with me in the valley. He promised Abraham these words, I am with thee. One generation later, he promised Isaac these very words, I am with thee. One generation later, he promised Jacob these very words, I am with thee. And then he told Joseph, I am with thee. And then he told Moses, I am with thee. And then he told Joshua, I am with thee. And then he told Gideon, I am with thee. And then he told David, I am with thee. He told Isaiah, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, though thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, fear thou not. For I am with thee, be not dismayed. I am thy God, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. He told Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. And when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went into the fiery furnace, he just didn't watch from heaven and say, I know what you're going through down there. He showed up in that fire. Because God is around. Aren't you glad you got that kind of God? Not a God that just watches from a distance as we struggle through life and he kind of cheers us on from heaven. You can do it. I hope you make it down there. No. He says, I will be with you through the valley. I will be with you through the difficulty. I will show up in your fire just like I showed up in their fire. I'm the kind of God that is everywhere and that includes right beside you no matter what you go through. I remember years ago when my oldest son, he's turning 28 this year, but my oldest son was about three years old. I was getting ready to go to Home Depot. And I said, hey, uh, Ryan, you want to go to Home Depot with Dad? He says, I don't know. I said, we're getting ice cream on the way home. He says, I'm coming. <laughs> now, I don't even know if I needed anything from Home Depot that day or if I just went to sniff the wood. <laughs> but I like to go to Home Depot and at least look at tools that I wish I had. I think some people call it coveting. I call it earnestly praying. Oh, God, give me those tools. Do you need those tools? I may someday. And no man can ever have too many tools. Can I get an amen there? Not too many tools, not too many guns, not too many ties. And so, I, God, I, I, I want to go look at these tools here. And so I'm looking at the tools, and I got my son. I'm bringing him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And I'm, I'm letting him see the tools. And they had all of these tools on display, power tools. And back then they had two racks. They had a low rack and an upper rack like that. Now, ladies, don't freak out. They're not plugged in, okay? And so it's not children playing with things that are going to cut their fingers off. But they had them on display there. And my son, he was down there looking at the table saws. And he was turning the little wheel and watching the, the blade go up and down and he was moving the dial back and forth and he was playing and, and I had kind of walked down and I said okay son come along and come along and come along and he was, he was enthralled he was down there playing and he didn't come along and I called him two or three times and he, he's still down there playing he's ignoring me so I decided it was time for a life lesson so I went around the end of the aisle and I came back down the aisle where I was right across from him I could see through the shelving, I could see exactly where he was. And I just waited. And I stood and I watched. And he played and he played. And before long, he finally looked up and he looked this way and daddy was gone. And he looked this way and daddy was gone. And he said, daddy. And I didn't answer. And so he started to walk this way and I walked with him. And I looked through the aisle and I saw where he was at. And he, daddy. 
He got to the end of the line. He looked down the big aisle this way, and he looked down the big aisle this way, and he got a little louder. Daddy! And I didn't answer. So he turned around. He walked all the way back down. I walked with him on the other side of the aisle, and he came all the way to the end of that aisle, and he looked down this big aisle, and he looked down that big aisle, and he still didn't see me. And he got a little louder now and a little more earnest in his voice. Daddy! A lady started to come to him, seeing that it was apparent he was lost. And as soon as she stepped towards him, I stepped out. And all I said was this, Ryan. And boy, like a magnet. <laughs> he came running and grabbed my leg. His feet weren't even on the ground now. It's like he was climbing a coconut tree. He was on my leg. I had to go to the car like this with him. And uh, he was not going to turn loose. And do you know what? From that day on, he never left daddy's side in the store. But can I remind you, I did not forsake my son. He thought he was forsaken. He could not see me, but I saw him the whole time. I was right there. And there's going to be times in your life you can't see God. And it sure seems like you've been forsaken. But God knows exactly where you are. And God is walking beside you the same way, and he's just waiting for you to see how badly you need your God. Sometimes when God finally calls our name, we come and we cling to him and decide, I'm not wandering away from him again. But God never leaves. God never forsakes. God is always around, whether you can see him or not. He is aware he is around. Take your Bible, go to Daniel chapter 3. We'll see a third truth to remember on a day that it's not so well to help you say it is well. Daniel chapter 3, you're familiar with the story. I referenced it earlier, beginning at verse number 16, the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. Now, friend, if all I had to hang on to was that God was aware of my trouble, or even that God is around in my trouble, if he was not able to deliver me from my trouble, it would be really hard to say it is well. But I've got good news for you. Our God is still able. Amen. Just like those three Hebrew boys got to look at that king and said, Our God is able to deliver. They weren't even sure if God would deliver them, but they did know this. He is able to deliver us. There is no fire so hot that God can't deliver them from. Even though the king turned the furnace seven times hotter, that didn't stop God. God didn't say, oh, that's too hot for me. I can't help you now. Boys, you're in deeper than I can rescue you. Hey, no matter how deep you get in, no matter how hot the fire gets, no matter how difficult your circumstance is, no matter how deep your valley may be, you have a God that is always able to deliver. That'll help you say it as well, even when it's not. Because God is able. He proved to Sarah he was able. And she had a child in her old age. He proved to Abraham he was able and he put a ram in the thicket. He proved to Moses he was able and he saw a burning bush that was not consumed. He proved to Pharaoh he was able and he brought ten plagues only on the Egyptians. He proved to the children of Israel he was able and he divided the Red Sea, gave them water from a rock, sent down manna from heaven, and made their clothes to never wear out. He proved to Joshua he was able and the walls came tumbling down. He proved to Gideon he was able and he defeated the Midianites with no, armor, uh, no, no weapons and 300 armed men against a, a host that was greater than could be numbered. He proved to Naaman he was able and he healed him in the Jordan River. He proved to the prophets of Baal he was able, and he sent down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. He proved to little widow woman he was able, and he filled all the pots with one cruise of oil. He proved to the lady at Zarephath he was able, and with a handful of meal she was sustained a lifetime. He proved to David he was able, and he brought down Goliath with one small stone. He proved to King Darius he was able, and he stopped the mouths of lions. He proved to Nebuchadnezzar he was able, and he made those three Hebrew boys fireproof. 
He proved to the blind and the deaf and the lame and the dumb he was able, and the Bible says he healed them all. He proved to Mary and Martha he was able, and he raised old Lazarus from the dead after four days. He proved the disciples he was able, and he spoke, peace be still, and the wind ceased, and the waves fell down flat. He proved to Peter he was able, and he walked on water. He proved a little lad he was able, and he fed 5,000 with just five loaves and two fishes. He proved to the whole world he was able. When up from the grave, he arose, a mighty triumph for his foes. Hey, our God has never been unable, and our God is still able yet tonight. He was able back then, he's able today, and he'll always be able. The Bible calls him the Almighty. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and judgment. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, which was and is and is to come. I am the Almighty. Hey, tonight, dear neighbor, I got good news. Our God is still powerful, and our God is still mighty, and our God is still omnipotent, and our God is still strong, and our God is still the rock, and our God is still rich, and our God is still the great physician, and our God is still the creator, and our God is still the deliverer, and our God is still a miraculous God. Our God always has been and always will be able And if God gave us 4,000 years of history in the Old Testament and 2,000 years of history that he's continued to be faithful and all these things were done for our admonition, it's so that you know and that I know when we also go through difficulties and we also go through valleys, our God is still able to deliver his children. When I'm at the end of my resources, it is well because God is able. When the odds are against me, It is well because God is able. When I have no solution, it is well because God is able. When I have no answer, it is well because God is able. When the doctors are baffled, it is well because God is able. When I don't know where to turn, it is well because God is able. When the world is against me and the devil is shooting at me and the flesh is pulling at me, it is well because God is able. And even when only a miracle will do, it is well because God is able. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The children of Israel asked Moses. God is able, he replies. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how can you stand up with courage before the king when he's about to throw you into the fiery flames? Because be it known unto you, O king, our God is able. Job, how can you say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Because I know that God is able. King Darius yells down in the lion's den, Oh, Daniel, is your God able to deliver you from the mouths of the lion? And Daniel hollers back up, my God is able. I'm okay. Lord, if you'd just been here, our brother had not died, said Mary. Lord, if you'd just been here, our brother had not died, said Martha. But it's certainly too late now. He's been dead for four days. Oh, but wait, ladies, you forgot. He is the resurrection and the life, and he is able. Little Shunammite woman, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child, Gehazi asked? And she replies, it is well. How can you say it is well? Because if God was able to give me a son in my barrenness, God is also able to raise my son from the dead if he so chooses. And he is able. Friend, it can be well, even when it doesn't seem well. If you'll remember, God is aware. If you'll remember, God is around. And if you'll remember, God is able. Go to Romans 8 and verse 28. A very familiar passage of Scripture, my life verse. But I want to tie it in to this passage this evening. How to say it is well even when it's not. 
Romans 8 and 28. You know the passage probably without even looking tonight. The Bible says, and we see. Is that what it says? No. And we perceive. No. And, and we can visualize. No. But here's something we do know. We know all things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. Last of all this evening, it is well because God is always right. I want to point out to you tonight, the Bible does not say all things are good to them that love God. It says all things work together for good. There will be some things that come into my life and things that come into your life that no doubt you would say not under any circumstance is this good. But that's because the story's not finished yet. It's just one ingredient of what God is doing. It doesn't say it looks right. It says God is always right. When it doesn't seem right, God is still always right. When it doesn't make sense to you, God is still always right. When, it doesn't, when you don't understand it, God is still always right. When you don't like it, God is still always right. When you don't agree with it, God is still always right. When you don't even believe it, it doesn't change the fact God is always right. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He's doing it for your good. And he says, if you'll just be patient and let you know this part I know that all things are going to work together for good. God's never been wrong. God's not wrong today. God never will be wrong. God has never made a mistake. God has never made an error. God has never made a bad decision. God has never been late. God has never been incorrect. God has never had poor judgment. God has never missed the mark. God has never come up short. God has never forgotten anything. God has never misplaced anything. God has never guessed. God has never estimated. God has never been close. God has never failed. God has never been surprised. Everything he does, he does on purpose. And everything he does, he does for a purpose. And everything he does is part of his almighty plan. And it's for my good. And it's for his glory. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? He is our rock. His work is perfect. Just and right is he. His ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts than our thoughts. I can promise you there will be days you don't understand what God is doing. You just got to go back to what we know. All things work together for good. If I called all these boys up here on the platform, I won't tonight. But if I called them up. I said, hey, guys, I want us to enjoy something together. How many of you like chocolate chip cookies? Raise your hand. Chocolate. I'm not talking about Chips Ahoy, those hockey pucks that they sell at the store. I'm talking about homemade, fresh from the oven, bend when you hold them out, chocolate streams from one piece to the other piece, moist, melts in your mouth, that kind of chocolate chip cookie. Are you on board with me? You like those kind of chocolate chip cookies? I do too. I love a good chocolate chip cookie. But if I said, now, I want you guys to come up here, and I, I want to give each of you an ingredient of chocolate chip cookies. And so I call the first man up, and I give him some eggs to eat, just raw eggs. I don't think that would go down very well. I call the next guy up, and I give him some Crisco. Everybody knows what Crisco is, right? And I, I give him some Crisco. That's what's got to go in chocolate chip cookies. I said, now, I want you to eat this Crisco. He's going to have to struggle with that. And I bring the next guy up, and I give him some flour. Oh, he'll enjoy that, won't he? Boy, his mouth will turn all pasty, and he'll look like he's got rabies foaming at the mouth, you know. And, but that's got to go into chocolate chip, so I gave him some flour. And I called the next guy up, and I gave him a little bit of margarine, you know, just about half a stick. I said, no, I just want you to eat this half a stick of margarine. And I called the next guy up, and I give him some imitation vanilla. Isn't it incredible how something that smells so good can taste so terrible? My sister, she's eight years older than I am. And I remember when I was a little kid, she was making some chocolate chip cookies. And I was over there sniffing the vanilla. I don't know if I was trying to get high or what, but I was sniffing the vanilla. It sure smelled good. And she, being a devious sister, an ungodly, reprobate sister, said, You want to try some, little boy? <laughs> and she poured some of that in a teaspoon and stuck that in my mouth. Can you believe it? She's in jail today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
She gave me what I thought I wanted, but I found out I didn't want. It wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. But that's got to go in the chocolate chip cookies. And yes, it's true, a little bit of water, a little bit of sugar, and some chocolate chips. Now, all those, we like all of those. But can I tell you that the majority of what goes into chocolate chip cookies you won't like? And sometimes in life, God's handing you one ingredient at a time. And it's kind of hard to swallow. It doesn't taste so good. You really don't enjoy it. But it's part of the recipe. And God did not say all things are good. He said, if you'll just be patient, all things are going to work together for good. And you're going to like the end product when I get all done. If you'll just trust me enough to take what I hand you. I really don't think that Job enjoyed each ingredient that came his way. But we weren't to Job 40 yet. I really don't think Joseph enjoyed each ingredient that came his way, hated of his brothers, thrown into the pit, sold into slavery, works for Potiphar, gets lied about, gets thrown into prison, gets forgotten about in prison. But we weren't to chapter 47 and 48 yet. I don't think Paul liked all the things that he went through. But he wasn't yet to, I've run a good race, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Even when God allows sickness, it is still well. And even when God allows sorrow, it is still well. And even when God allows weakness, it is still well. And even when God allows waiting, it is still well. And even when God allows financial reversal, it is still well. And even when God allows hurting, it is still well. And even when God brings burdens, it is still well. And even when God brings death, it is still well. And even when God brings tragedy, it is still well. Because no matter how I see it, or how I understand it, or I don't understand it, there's a truth in the Word of God that all things work together for good. And God is always right. And I'm going to like the final product in the end. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In the flesh, you'll want to ask why. In the flesh, you'll think this is unfair. In the flesh, you'll want to doubt God's love. In the flesh, you won't understand what God is doing. But by faith, you can say it is well, even when it's not, because God is always right. I remember very clearly the day my wife called me as I sat in my office at the church, and she was just weeping on the other end of the phone uncontrollably. I said, Robin, what is wrong? Tell me, what is wrong? We had just found out recently, just several months previous, that we were going to have a little baby and she called to tell me she'd lost the baby. I remember leaving the office and going home and sitting on the couch and holding her hand. And we wept together. And we cried together. And we felt empty together. And quite honestly, I didn't understand it. Quite honestly, I didn't even know how to help her through that because here we were serving God. Here we were trying to please the Lord. We were busy in the service of the king and we were giving our lives to people and here there's parents out there that don't even want their children and parents that are boarding their children. Here we were going to try to raise our children the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It didn't make sense to me. And then we lost a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and every time I saw that light just dimming in her eyes I said, oh God, please help. I sent out 200 letters to pastors and missionaries and old saints of God I knew and found little children that had faith as a child and I had them start to pray. And God gave us another son. And it was a miracle. I don't have time to go into all the story, but it was a miracle that he was even born. Can I tell you this? All through those years of losing those children, it sure didn't seem like God was right. But I can't tell you the scores and scores and scores of couples now. We've gone to the hospital. 
and we've sat by their bedside, and we've held their hands, and we've wept, and we've prayed, because we know what they're going through. My wife has had the opportunity to speak to crowds of ladies that have gone through miscarriages and try to be a blessing and a help. Just last December, my phone rang, and it was my son, and he was weeping. And he said, Dad, we just lost a baby. I didn't know all those years back that someday God was going to need me to be ready to help my own son go through the same thing. But I found out God is always right. Amen. And he said, Dad, I didn't realize how much I needed you until today because I know you know how I feel. And I said, son, I do. And we prayed on the phone and we wept on the phone and I spent an hour trying to encourage my son and I hanged up the phone and I said to God, thank you. Thank you for letting me go through that valley so that someday I'd be able to help my own son as well as hundreds of other people along the way. You see, dear friend, I can promise you there'll be times you don't understand it. But we know God is always right. God has a plan. And all things work together for good. It was the late 1800s. A Christian businessman was grieving beside his wife as their son had died unexpectedly. Shortly thereafter, the great Chicago fire of 1871 burned up almost all the real estate that he owned along Lakeshore Drive. And he found himself pretty much with nothing. Two years later, he'd saved up enough money. He was going to send his family and then go meet them in England to help D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey. He said, I believe we just need to go and spend some time helping them and healing for our family's sake. We went through the loss of our son. We went through the loss of all of our finances and all of the real estate that I had. And pretty much my whole business is gone. We're just going to go help the man of God. He sent his wife and his daughters on ahead. He had a little bit of business he had to finish up, and he says, I'll come join you there shortly. Before they made it to Europe, their ship was struck by another, and in 12 minutes, that ship sank to the bottom of the ocean floor. His wife miraculously was spared. And when she got to Europe, she wired a telegram back to her husband with just two words, saved alone. His four daughters now were in the bottom of the ocean. He lost his son. He'd lost his business. He'd lost his finances. He'd lost his wealth. And now he lost his four daughters. He took the next ship that was heading to Europe and he went to the captain. He said, would you do me a favor? When we get to the spot that that ship sank where my daughters drowned. Would you come and get me and just stop for a moment? The captain said he would. And just off the shores of Europe, the engines ceased from roaring, and the captain went and knocked on Mr. Spafford's door. And he brought him to the top of the deck, and Mr. Spafford looked off into that gloomy water, the grave of his four daughters, he went back to his room and he took a pen and he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roar, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Mr. Spafford, you lost your son and buried him before his time. Mr. Spafford, all your wealth and assets have been burnt. Mr. Spafford, your four daughters have drowned in the ocean. You do understand they're not waiting for you at the other dock. You're, you're there with just you and your wife. You'll never see him in this life again. How can you say those words, it is well? It is not well with you, Mr. Spafford. I know, but by faith I can say it is well. 
Because in this tragedy, God had a purpose. And God had a plan. And God had my best interest in mind. And somehow God's going to get the glory. Because God is always right. And dear friend, it might not be well with your bank account. But it can still be well with your soul. And it might not be well with your body. But it can still be well with your soul. It might not be well in your family, but it can still be well with your soul. It might not be well in your marriage, but it can still be well with your soul. It might not be well with your boss or your, your vehicle, your relationships or your situation or your circumstance, but you can know this. Hey, wait a minute. God is aware and God is around and God is able and God is always right. So even when it's not well, it is still well. Honey, little lady says, our son died. Have one of the servants go get a donkey so I can go see the man of God. Oh, why must you go today? It's too late. We can't do anything about it. He's already dead, says the husband. And she says, it shall be well. Gehazi meets her as she approaches Elisha. Is it well with yourself? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she says, it is well. Am, how can you say that? Is not your heart full of sorrow? Did you not weep on that donkey all the way here? Does not your soul ache within you? Oh, yes, she replies. But it changes not the truth that it is well. How can you say in the valley of heartbreak? Because by faith, even when it doesn't seem well, even when it doesn't feel well, I know God is aware. I know God is around. I know God is able. And I know God is always right. I don't know where you're at, dear friend. I'll have to admit to you, there's been times in my lack of faith, I sure didn't see what God was trying to do. But through those valleys, God has begun to build my faith to even when it's not well, still say, like Mr. Spafford and like the little Shunammite woman, it is well. Heavenly Father, as your children, you're going to allow us to go through some difficulties that's not going to be well. Just the raw truth of it is there will be some hard days that we face, some heavy burdens that we carry, some obstacles that seem too big to overcome. God, I pray that you help us tonight and you help us each day to build our faith, to like this little lady be able to say, it is well, even on days that it's not. God, for some here tonight, maybe that's tonight, they need to step out by faith and say, it is well. Maybe for some, that's just around the corner. Maybe it's two or three or four years down the road. I don't know, but we all will face some valleys and some hardships. God, I pray that you'll help us to remember these truths and cause it to stir and strengthen our faith to be able to say it is well, even on days it's not. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed, can I ask you, dear friend, when you face the valley, when you face the hardship, isn't it easy to get your eyes on what you don't understand instead of what we know? These Bible truths that we all said amen to and we agree with sometimes just kind of fade into the horizon as we face the darkness of the night. But I pray that God will allow these truths to illuminate in your mind and in your heart in your dark valley so that you can say it is well even when it's not. Let's stand to our feet. She's playing that song. It's an invitation song. If you're not going to come to the altar, I'd encourage you to sing it. But God, if they would come to the altar, God, I believe they need to ask for your help because I've been there. I thought I could do it in my flesh, but in the middle of the circumstance, it just was difficult. God, help us to have learned something from the little Shunammite tonight. To realize and remember and lean on these truths in the midst of our valley. Let's stand together. Let's come together. Let's sing together. When peace like a river, we'll sing it from the top.
for us on the other side and we know that God promised that there's a heaven waiting for those that have trusted Christ as their Savior and I promise there all will be well you can hang on for a few days down here even in your trials if remember up there it's all going to be and Lord haste the day when our face shall be sight and Lord haste the day when my face shall the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump it shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul put together a couple of messages today I tell you I'm just um, I'm just amazed how God puts things together and I, that was a perfect perfect um, summary conclusion the, the the flip side of what we preached this morning thank you brother for listening to the Holy Spirit well church we want to give these folks an offering brother can we get the offering plates and put them down here like we do and uh, we'll put the offering plates here if you could give and, and help these folks. You know, gasoline's a lot more expensive these days, and uh, we're going to take them and get them, a, get them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich this, tonight, but, uh, but uh, we want to help them along their way, help them with their expenses. So if you could do that, that certainly would be a blessing. You know, we know the folks there at Lone Star got some folks there. Uh, uh, you know, we... <laughs> We've known Brother Wells for a long time. Some of you remember when Brother Wells would come here when he was in evangelism, before he took the church there, he would come here every year right before Christmas. He would come and then uh, and preach here right before Christmas, and now Brother Tim Green comes at that spot. But um, but nonetheless, uh, we know those folks and and uh, doing a great job. And, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the McDowells are there, and, 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 and they have a good testimony. With they, Brother Patrick's there, and, you know, it's amazing. They have the same attitude towards Patrick as we did. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Well, amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Don't forget the prayer request that we mentioned. Don't forget the prayer request that we mentioned. Let's continue to pray for our church family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Let's sing together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family.